And so people say, oh, well, you know, what's the difference between swimming at zero degrees centigrade and minus 1.7? It is the difference between walking in the foothills of the Rockies and climbing Mount Everest in the middle of winter, oh. okay, on your own. It is quantumly different. It is extremely painful. You feel that that water, as soon as you dive in, I can barely breathe, I'm gasping for air, that that water just grips its way around you and holds you like a vice. Every single stroke is very, very difficult to take. Every single part of you is saying, get out of here immediately, you're in a death zone. And you've got to persuade your mind that actually you can do this and that you need to start swimming, and, but swimming fast. Welcome to Champions Mojo Weekly Podcast, where your hosts Kelly Palace and Maria Parker share with you what it takes to be a champion. Kelly is a former Division I head swim coach, Olympic trials qualifier, and holds Masters World and National Swimming Records, and Maria holds world records in endurance cycling, and was the overall women's winner of the world's toughest bike race, Race Across America. They'll be sharing their personal stories and wisdom, along with interviewing other champions to give you the tools you need for becoming a true champion in your own life. And now, your host, Kelly Palace. Yes, that is a whale song to get your attention and let you know that today's show will be the first of two segments one week apart, and that we'll be talking about the oceans with the amazing endurance ice water swimmer and United Nations patron of the oceans, Lewis Pugh. Next week, we'll release part two as episode number 37. We hope you'll enjoy this first segment and tune in next week for the conclusion. It just might change your life as it has mine. Hello, friends. Welcome to the Champions Mojo podcast, where today we guarantee that you will be inspired by our guest, Lewis Pugh. Lewis is the only person to have completed a long distance swim in every ocean of the world. To date, he has pioneered more swims around famous landmarks than any other swimmer in history. Each of these seemingly in possible feats was done to raise awareness about the vulnerability of our oceans and their importance to humanity. And he's not finished yet. He puts his body on the line to get people talking about marine protected areas. More on this later. Lewis caught my attention several years ago when he swam a thousand meters in the North Pole in sub freezing temperatures. So it, salt water freezes at a lower temperature than regular water, but it was absolutely, if you watch the video, which is online, he's swimming through chunks of ice. So after that, last summer, he swam 329 miles or 528 kilometers in the English Channel over a 50 day period. And that too was in dangerously cold waters. While some people call what he's done the Mount Everest of swimming, I say it's way bigger than Mount Everest. Lewis Pugh is in a class by himself. Thousands of people have climbed Mount Everest, but what Lewis Pugh has done, no one in the swimming community has ever accomplished. We've had Olympic gold medalists on here, but in my opinion, as a, an elite level swimming coach, Lewis Pugh is above and beyond even an Olympic gold medal. So before we bring Lewis in, I want to welcome my co-host, Maria. Maria, great to have you here today. Hello. Hey, Kelly. It's great to be here. And you know that I'm interested in people who do really tough things. And I can't think of anything tougher than the swims, <clears throat> swims Lewis has completed. And Lewis is getting the attention this cause deserves. Over 7 million people have viewed his TED Talks. Countless others have followed him on BBC, Good Morning America, CNN, Jon Stewart, National Geographic, Sky News, Al Jazeera, Jay Leno, and more. His autobiography, Achieving the Impossible, is a bestseller and was chosen for Oprah's exclusive book list. And from what I understand, there are more tough feats coming. I can't wait to talk with Lewis. Yes, absolutely. Me too, Maria. There's so much on Lewis's resume. We could talk all day long. If you want to learn more about Lewis and his causes, go to lewispew.com. But we want to chat with him. So let's get to it. 
And Lewis, great to have you. Welcome to Champions Mojo. Yes, Lewis, welcome. Thank you so much for chatting with us. Thank you both very, very much. It's wonderful to be here. So Lewis flew in today from South Africa. So we are just, we're, we're sitting in Boston um, in this great hotel and he's come in to give a speech tonight and work on his cause. He's tireless. He doesn't just uh, swim these big swims, but he gets on planes and goes talk to talks with important people about what's going on in the world. And I'm going to start with a simple question first for you, Lewis. So as a fellow swimmer, I have uh, dived into my share of cold oceans, lakes, or pools, and my morning routine is my freezing cold showers. But cold water is truly one of the most uncomfortable things that I think we can experience as a human. Just It's just, it's just blastedly unpleasant, even painful. So how do you convince yourself to get in and to stay in these dangerously cold waters for a long time? Let's just put cold into perspective. If I had one last day left on this earth, where would I want to swim? I'd like to swim in the middle of the Indian Ocean in nice warm water. So I don't gravitate, <laughs> <laughs> I don't gravitate towards I don't like water. it. You don't like it. No. It's, it's, I do it, uh, there's a certain thrill in it, and it's very, very challenging. But the reason why I swim in the extreme cold stuff is because these parts of the world are changing very, very quickly. And so I'm getting in there to, to show the world what is happening. So I'm doing swims in places which until very recently were completely frozen over. So it tells a very, very clear story about the health of the planet and the speed of change. How do you get in there? Uh, you've got to have a very, very driving purpose uh, and self-belief as well. In, in listening to your TED Talks and, and reading about you, I'm aware that every time you do this, it's really, really hard. I think people can say, oh, it's Lewis Pugh, he's different than the rest of us. But you have talked about courage, and you say that courage is a muscle that you have to work. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yes, yeah, so some... Some journalists say, well, Lewis has this thing called anticipatory thermogenesis. Just to quickly explain that, to break the word down, anticipatory before thermo, heat, genesis, creation. So this is before I get into cold water, we've noticed that my core body temperature rises quite significantly uh, in temperature uh, by about two degrees centigrade. And so that enables me to spend longer in very, very cold water than, than untrained people. And they use this as a way of saying, well, Lewis is special. Lewis has got this talent, and so he probably doesn't feel the cold as much as, as, as normal untrained people. It, it couldn't be further from the truth. The reason why I'm good in the cold is because I spend time in the cold. I'm now going into my fourth decade of swimming, right? So four, you know, 30, 33 years now of swimming. And most of that has been in very, very cold places. You, you've somebody, uh, I, I can't remember what interview I read, but somebody, you know, was talking about this anticipatory thermogenesis and, you know, like it's like you're Superman and you have this super gift and, and the point you're making now is that you've trained, but you, you said once that it's caused by fear. I, <laughs> that's which is interesting, like you're terrified and so you get warmer. Is, 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 am I getting that right? Yes, you're getting it right. So some scientists have said, no, no, this is a Pavlovian response. Lewis has spent so much time in the cold that before he gets into the cold, he realizes subconsciously that he has to warm himself up, uh, and so his, his core body temperature rises. I, I'm not sure that's correct. It may be correct. Who knows? All I know is that before I get into very, very cold water, if I'm in the Arctic or the Antarctic, and especially if there are polar bears around or the leopard seals in the water, I'm terrified. Be under no illusions, I'm terrified because, you know, I'm undertaking swims which have never been attempted before in water which is extremely, extremely cold, minus 1.7 degrees centigrade, okay? And so I'm terrified and my core body temperature rises. But just going back to your initial point, which is about courage and about training, uh, I'm good in the cold because I, I spend a lot of time in the cold. I found, and so I'm, I'm now will be turning 50 this year, that if you don't push yourself into those very, very dangerous places, those places of fear and concern, then you soften up really, really quickly. 
uh, and I found I'm beginning, beginning to soften up and then not so keen to jump into the very cold water and terrified if they're predators in the water. And, and so now on a very regular basis, I uh, go down to a beach late at night off Cape Town and I swim on my own. And to normal people, uh, that would sound like absolutely crazy. What, you're going to be swimming in water where there are great white sharks late at night on your own. <laughs> but the point is that when you swim off Cape Town late at night, everything looks like a great white shark. <laughs> every shadow <laughs> looks like a great white shark. <laughs> every, piece of, every piece of kelp feels like a great white shark. I can't wait till I get out and then I get back into bed. But when I've done that, then I feel confident that I have what it takes to go into even tougher environments. For example, the Arctic or the Antarctic, where you're dealing with very serious predators in extreme cold water, where your life really is on the line. When you are face down in the middle of a swim like that, where it's, it's truly extremely dangerous. I mean, if, if someone isn't prepared, even a, an excellent swimmer, and we have a lot of excellent swimmers listening, they wouldn't last five minutes in that type of water if they weren't prepared. So, for example, when you swim the 1,000 meters in the North Pole in those chunks of ice, you were in there for about 18 minutes, which is actually, for those of you that know a thousand meter time, that's a pretty darn good time. Just if you swam in a technical suit and dove off the block in a pool, that's a pretty respectably fast time anyway. But so you're in there, what are you saying to yourself each stroke? You can con your mind. If you really understand your mind, you can con it for a short period of time. I'm saying to myself, there's no other place in the world I'd rather be right here, right now. I've got to honest, honestly believe that this is what I was meant to do with my life. And you're willing to even give your life possibly for this cause? Yeah, I mean, beyond no illusions, it, it, you're in a, in a death zone. I mean, water is an interesting substance. It's a fascinating substance. So at, at between zero and 100 degrees centigrade, it's a liquid. Above 100 degrees centigrade, it becomes a gas. But below zero degrees centigrade, it becomes a solid. And as soon as you start swimming below zero degrees centigrade, something happens. And so people say, oh, well, you know, what's the difference between swimming at zero degrees centigrade and minus 1.7? It is the difference between walking in the foothills of the Rockies and climbing Mount Everest in the middle of winter, oh. okay, on your own. It is quantumly different. It is extremely painful. You feel that, that water, as soon as you dive in, I can barely breathe, I'm gasping for air. That, that water just grips its way around you and holds you like a vice. Every single stroke is very, very difficult to take. Every single part of you is saying, get out of here immediately, you're in a death zone. And you've got to persuade your mind that actually you can do this and that you need to start swimming, and, but swimming fast. By swimming fast? Yeah, well, I mean, you need, you need to move fast. You, you can't dilly-dally in that type of water. <laughs> do, do you, uh, you know, how important is, is I mean, I, I know the answer to this, but tell me about the having a purpose. You know, you're not just doing this to show off your swimming skills. You're, you're doing it for something extremely important. Would you be able to do it without this purpose? I don't think so. I don't think so. I mean, I mean, for me, it's become a what I get up for in the morning or what I go to bed at night thinking about. Uh, as I said earlier, I've been swimming for 30 years in, in that period of time, which in terms of swimming is a, long, is a long career, swimming for 30 years. But in terms of the history of the world, it's a nanosecond. In, in that short period of time, I've seen uh, our oceans change uh, hugely. I mean, just to give you an example, when I trained to do that swim across the North Pole, I trained on the edge of the Arctic ice packs on a little island in, in the top of Norway. It was a thousand kilometers to the North Pole. And I trained on the edge of the Arctic ice and the water was three degrees centigrade. I went back there two years ago. The water's no longer three. It's now 10 degrees centigrade. Oh my goodness. So that's a speed at which the Arctic now in the Norwegian sector is changing because of climate change. It's runaway climate change. And when you see that, you, you have a choice. And the choice is very, very simple. You're either going to do something about it or you're not going to do something about it. I felt 
that this that I should stand up and, and be a voice for the oceans and for the incredible wildlife that that live in these regions who rely on us now to make good decisions and to get the earth back into its healthy state. That's a truly, truly amazing. So you're, you once said, and I think it might have been after the North Pole when this is how painful it is for you, that you were done with cold water swimming. And what, I mean, was that just a, how tough it was when you came out of that? When you've been really cold. I mean, really cold. You never ever quite warm up again. <laughs> wow! So That's I wish, yeah, I wish you people could see the look in his eyes when he says that. <laughs> so I did a swim uh, a few years ago down in Antarctica, where the water temperature was minus one point seven, uh. and the air temperature was minus thirty seven degrees centigrade. And I'll never ever forget it because we're in the most remote part of Antarctica. We've sailed for two, two and a half weeks from the bottom of New Zealand. We, uh, you know, so if you're going to compete in the Olympic Games, you know that you're going to be competing in Tokyo on the 5th of August at 4 p.m. in the, you know, in the 100 meters freestyle. And you know exactly what you need to, need to do to get yourself ready for that specific moment. So we've sailed, and we don't even know whether we're going to be able to get to the swim site because we're, you know, we're sailing through you know, some of the most dangerous seas on this earth. We sailed from 40 degrees south to 50 to 60 to 70, and now in, on the distance is this enormous great ice shelf. I want you to imagine the White Cliffs of Dover. Okay, that's what it was like, but it's ice, it's a Ross ice shelf. And you've got these strong catabatic winds coming down from the South Pole, coming over this, and ice just coming down uh, from, 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 the, from, the, from this ice shelf into the water. And the water is freezing cold, minus 1.7. So nobody's ever swum there before. You know, I don't get into the water unless somebody does a quick recce of the water to see <laughs> what's in the water. So, so I said to my wife, I said, Antoinette, would you please get into a small zodiac and go along the edge of the ice um, there and make sure there are no killer whales in the water, no leopard seals in the water, because you know I don't want to be uh, don't want to be swimming with, with with either of them. And I'll never ever forget it, my whole life, because she was lowered in a small zodiac into the sea, and a wave hit it up against the side of the zodiac, and water splashed up, and it turned into ice oh, mid air and hit her, and then she went up and down for half an hour. That's the minimum amount of time that's required to make sure there are no animals in the water. She came back into the cabin and she was absolutely frozen. And then she looked at me and she said, uh, we're ready. And so that moment you've got you know, a serious question to ask, are, are you now prepared to get into that water for your belief? And uh, I'll never forget diving into that water because, so the water's minus 1.7, but you pull your hand out and your, your hand is going from minus 1.7 to minus 37. So you almost want to put it back in quickly. It's, 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 it's a very extreme environment in which to operate. My, stu my stomach is just <laughs> in a knot. I know. <laughs> thinking I know. about it. I, I, I'm thinking about a hot cup of tea. So, <laughs> How do you train? So this, you're saying that this is not something unique to you, that you truly train hard to get your body ready to do this. What are some of the just like big chunks of training that you do to prepare for this? Let me, let me take you a step back. Do you, do you know about the Japanese concept of shuhari? No. What is it? Okay. So my chief of staff is Japanese, and he talks to me about shuhari. Shuhari are the, are the three stages one goes through in mastering anything, okay? And it comes from Japanese martial art. Shu means learn the law. Ha means break the law. And ri means make the law. So for the first 10 years of my swimming career, it was just shu. It was just learn the law, obey the law. Go every single day down to the swimming pool, down to the, to the beach, and swim with my coach, Kevin Fialkoff, uh, 
and, and just try and make every single stroke as perfect as it is, as it could ever be. Long stroke, relaxed stroke, take a deep breath of fresh air, repeat. And that was 10 years. And I found that the most difficult of th these three stages because there's no choice of individualism there. There's no choice to, you know, how many coaches want to work with somebody who doesn't really want to, you know, obey the law? Every single coach wants you to obey the law. But then we move into the second stage of my career, which was the ha, which means break the law. This came very naturally to me. I loved it. Maybe I think at the, at the time I was serving as a reservist in the Special Air Service, which is the British Special Forces, your equivalent of US Navy SEALs, where you're taught that breaking the law is actually uh, uh, not a bad thing. Mm -hmm. you, you know, you, you, you need to be uh, pushing boundaries. But also because uh, I was living in South Africa and the people who went out to live in South Africa, generally there were people who didn't want to live in the United Kingdom because all the rules and regulations. There was, a, there was a colonial spirit out there. So this stage of my life was absolutely great. This was where I had a new coach. His name was Brian Button. He said to me, Lewis, take lane four. And all I want you to do, Lewis, is just swim. And you just go for it. And I believe in you. And you know when he said, I believe in you? And he'd coached, he, he was 75 years old at the time. When he said to me, I believe in you, well, I believed in myself. And, and I started pushing boundaries and, 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 and breaking every single law that I could break. If there was a harbor master who said I couldn't, I couldn't swim through his harbor, I swam past his harbor. Uh, and it was at this stage where I was becoming an environmental activist. And, and so uh, if there was a government official who said I couldn't do something, well, I would, I would push ahead and do it. And it was at a time when social media was becoming very active and, you know, I could really start pushing, pushing boundaries. But then the final stage, these last sort of 10 years, is the re-stage. It's a stage where now you start making the law. So now I go and swim down in the Ross Sea in Antarctica, and now I go to Russia to negotiate the creation of this big protected area. And for 17 years, government officials from the United States and from various other countries have been trying to persuade Russia to, to join the rest of the community and protect this area, and all of them have failed. But I believe that I can... I make can, the law. I can, I can pull it off and I can begin to make the law. And you walk into those negotiations with a feeling that I'm coming in here to make the law, not out of arrogance, sir, but out of humility, out of, I believe that we can do this because it's right for all of us. And when you get to that stage, very, very few things become impossible to achieve. That is just... I've got goosebumps. That is amazing. So, and when you gain that kind of respect, when you when you put your life on the line and say, "I'm willing to do this for the oceans," then I I would imagine that just opens doors for you to talk with it, people. It transcends culture. It transcends nationality. It transcends everything. I, it was very very interesting. There was a a, a Russian called Slava Fetisov. Uh, Slava Fetisov, Americans will, will have heard of because he was this great Soviet ice hockey player uh, who was the first of the great Russians to come and play ice hockey here in America. And um, he, he introduced me to all the, the Russian officials who had to make the decision that they were going to uh, join the rest of the world to create this protected area down in the Ross Sea. It was astonishing because as soon as I arrived in Russia, I, you know, I was put on state television, I was introduced to everybody, and I couldn't understand this because, you know, I'd come from Britain, we are traditional Cold War enemies, uh, we had grown up in very, very different environments. Uh, when I went out to South Africa as a young, as a young man, I'd served in the, in, in the South African military at the time we were fighting Soviet forces in Angola, and here I was walking into the Kremlin. I said to him, I said, uh, Slava, why is it that you, the Russians have been so welcoming to me? He said, you know, Lewis, your message is very, very simple. Your message is about coming here, building bridges, protecting the environment. It's about listening. Uh, he said that transcends everything. You, know, you're not, you haven't come here to cause trouble. You've come here to try and solve a problem. And uh, that's why, that's why the door is open. So, uh, you know, with any of these negotiations, there's a promised land. You just need to find it. 
Wow. Your, 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 your swims have tr transcended what other people, you know, can do. And, and anybody who sees a, a video of you pulling yourself out of the water onto an ice, a piece of ice, <laughs> you know, in the North Pole or Antarctica, you know, they, they just, they have to stop and listen and they are they're calling it speedo diplomacy and it's you know it's amazing and and but but I'm sort of interested in you know you talked about your coach and that he encouraged you to that that you know that you were he said you were good and you could do anything and that that gave you encouragement and you said in one of your videos that your friend David you had you had sort of a bad bad swim prior to your north pole swim and he he, he came into the room and said, I've seen you train, your purpose is important, you will succeed, have courage, we're gonna take care of you. And that changed everything for you. I wanna know how important this encouragement from others has been in your success. It's interesting because if I go back to the beginning of my life, uh, I was very lucky with my parents. Um, I had very, very loving parents. They didn't push me, but they didn't pull me they just supported me if that makes sense so you certainly in the swimming community you, you do see some parents who are very very pushy uh, others who do everything for their children and others who are sometimes hold them back by by sharing their limiting beliefs with their children my parents did none of that they just said lewis if you enjoy it uh, crack on and it's wonderful to see you enjoying it and they were always very very supportive but when it came to actually putting the swims together when it came to the fundraising I had to do all that myself, and that is tough. So this is not the, the Olympic Games where uh, USA uh, Swimming is now going to provide the sponsorship for you and, 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 and the funding for you to go and compete in the Tokyo Olympic Games. I now had to learn how to raise the money, learn how to, to do interviews with the media, learn how to uh, put a whole team together and now start getting a, a yacht or a boat and, and start sailing to the most remote parts of the planet. My parents didn't lay out any money for me. They, uh, they, they were very warm and encouraging, but they, 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 the support was there, but they weren't pushing me. And that was absolutely uh, instrumental in, in creating a person who felt comfortable and uh, yeah Maria do you, did you get that question answered do you feel like yeah I, I guess I I was looking for you have it sounds to me like you have created an amazing team you've surrounded yourself with people who help you to to do what you do I mean you are absolutely doing you know the hard work but I'm I guess, you know, what I'm getting at, it, what I'm asking is, you know, how did you do that? How did you find these amazing teammates? I'm always hunting new, new members of the team. Not, not so that I can get rid of old members of the team, but I'm always looking to see whether I can get the very, very best people. Because when you're surrounded, here's the point. Courage is contagious, but equally fear is contagious. If I'm standing on the edge of the ice and I'm just about to die in and I see fear on anybody's face, that'll ripple through me within seconds and debilitate me. But if I'm standing on the edge of the ice and I'm about to dive in and everybody is looking confident and there's a fixed mindset that we're going to start at the beginning and we're going to go all the way to the end, we're going to get out and then we're going to have a hot shower afterwards, I'm going to get in there with a lot of confidence. So I, I always look for, for various things with, with the members of my team. I'm looking for people who, in their personal lives, are courageous people. So for example, the doctor who is with me at the North Pole, he's going to have to be the most courageous person because if something goes wrong there, everyone's going to say, well, what on earth did you think? <laughs> Why did you think that this person could do it? But equally, every single person in the team has to be courageous. I'm also looking for people who uh, love to push boundaries, I'm looking for people who are optimistic realists, not pessimists, not cynics, not daydreamers, optimistic realists, people who say, let's roll up our sleeves and let's give this a very good go. And lastly, I'm looking for people who realize that time is finite, that we're facing an emergency now, that we're now in a race against time to save the planet, and so we've got a mission, and we must, we must act with a sense of urgency. 
but also people who realize that, that our lives are finite and that we have a choice about how we're going to spend each and every day of our lives and this is how I and I hope all the members of my team we want to spend our lives which is being a voice for the for our oceans well Maria you and I are rarely caught speechless, aren't we? <laughs> so true. <laughs> so after some of uh, Lewis's answers, I think we, it was just all of it was said and we were just absorbing it joyfully. And uh, uh, well, I some, was inspired. Sometimes I was just yeah. dumbfounded, like, wow, I've, I've never heard that idea or I've never heard it put that way. And I just, yeah, I didn't have another thing to say. <laughs> it was just yes. silence. <laughs> We were we were we were struck silent in a in the best possible way, but we d we have uh, composed ourselves and we are ready to um, we're ready to do our takeaways because there is so much and we're actually going to break it into two sections for uh, his interview because it did go a little bit over an hour with him talking and so we wanted to take the first uh, I think twenty eight minutes of what he questions he answered and what we got out of him. And I want to start out right out of the gate with, you know, this is a man, my takeaway is that this is a man that swims in water that we cannot even fathom how cold it is. Uh, he talked about it being in the death zone that um, you never, he never truly warms up, you know, that this is so cold. And, and one of the things that I think might be a little bit confusing to some of our listeners is he usually talks in centigrade. And of course, uh, us Americans, we're talking in Fahrenheit. So let's just use the term freezing temperature. So 32 Actually, degrees below Fahrenheit. below freezing. Yeah. Below well, freezing. I'm saying we're going to talk about below freezing, right. but we're going to start with right. the freezing of zero is centigrade and 32 for Fahrenheit. So Salt water freezes below, it has to go below zero and below 32. So that is just, you know, painfully, dangerously cold waters. And I think that was the, the very first thing. My takeaway is I don't think any of us can even grasp how cold this is. And when he talks about a vice being around his, his waist, I, I can give a really quick uh, mark. My husband and I, you know, he's from Southern California, San Diego. We were doing the Oceanside Pier swim one September. It was actually the middle of September, and the water had flipped, as the lifeguards called it. So it was 55 degrees, Ooh. which is, uh, it's, it's, you know, again, this is 30 degrees warmer than temperatures that Lewis swims in, but it was 55 degrees. So... The gun, you know, we're all on the shore, the gun goes off, and I charge into the water, and I had not done any cold water swimming. I had been in the pool, and I got up to my chest, and I literally was just could not breathe. It was like a vice around my lungs, and I just stood there for quite a few minutes until the whole wave is gone, everybody's gone, Mark's gone. Um, and I'm alone and the lifeguard actually approaches me and says, are you okay? And I said, I can't breathe. It, it literally felt like somebody was squeezing the life out of me. So I, in one of my rarest occasions, I turned around and did not complete that swim because I just, it was just too cold for me. So wow. that was just 55 degrees. Right, so my point, right. with, you know, my point with this is Lewis is in 29, 28 degrees Fahrenheit. That's 55 degrees Fahrenheit that I'm talking about. So um, that is the my takeaway is how does he get into this? And this is my takeaway. He said he has a driving purpose. And I think that when one has this kind of purpose that Lewis has to be an ocean advocate and, you know, save the oceans, that he's willing to go into the the death zone into these dangerous places and and certainly train for it but um so that that's it uh that that if we really want to achieve extraordinary things that when you have a driving purpose it's going to give you kind of a superpower what do you think of that maria uh, i totally agreed I, I think one of the things that really stuck with me when he was describing the swim at the north pole was that it was the water was black you know, he was yes, ba basically yes. diving into the, so I, 
I can't imagine the cold because I don't even like to be a little bit cold. <laughs> so yes. I, I can't imagine doing that. But yes, I obviously in listening to him, he knows what he's about. He knows what he's going to do. And that's and 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 really an extension of that. He talked about courage and fear. He talked about going soft. So we might think, OK, this guy is he's Superman. He's he's not like the rest of us. But he. He said he's afraid. And he said he said courage is a muscle that gets flabby. That just blew me away. We think of some people as being brave and some other people as not being brave, but he said I, I I was going I I was going soft, so I have to start doing these nighttime swims so that I can <laughs> build up my courage. And I that that just blew me away because I thought to myself, so true. We can think that we're brave and then if we don't do things that that we're afraid of, if we don't do things that challenge us, our, our courage muscle will get flabby. So I loved that as a take home. And I've used that, uh, actually this just a couple of weeks, these last, uh, couple of days, I was, I was in a place where I, I was supposed to interact with some people that I was really nervous about interacting with. And I, that's not normal for me. I'm very extroverted, but I saw these people as experts in, I saw myself as not an expert and I, but I, but I, after listening to Lewis, I made myself go and, and, and talk to these people that I was really afraid and intimidated by. And I thought, I'm going to, I'm going to work this stupid courage muscle. I'm going to, I'm not going to, I'm going to stop being so flabby. (laughs) So I, I loved, I think, you know, behind his, behind his, his super human, acts is is courage that he's developed by working his courage muscle yes yes i absolutely loved that too and and i was inspired and that's what one of the things that why we do this podcast that we hope that it will inspire you listeners to to do things that you know you might have been scared of and and i i I told you marie and i just have to i have to tell our friends out there so after uh the interview with with lewis in boston um one of my kind of fears that I that I can avoid and have avoided all my life is driving in long tunnels. Now I can drive through shorter tunnels, tunnels where you can see the light at the end of the tunnel, but there is a we were we we interviewed uh Lewis in Boston where he, you know, he flew in to do some work as an ocean advocate in the Boston area. He flew all the way from South Africa and so afterwards I had to go to my hotel which was across town and required me to go through a big long tunnel underwater and so i had already prior to lewis's interview i had already gps'd my way back to my hotel that took me around about way so i did not have to go through the tunnel and after the let's not get soft and (laughs) let's do things that made us fearful i literally said i'm going through the tunnel so i you know, I just, I, I, it, it totally got me to do things out of my comfort zone too. And I think, you know, that's just, that's one of the things that we do as, uh, as people for each other, but Lewis really helped me there too. So it's, it's so a great I, I concept feel, yeah. for, for us, yeah. for those of us who know about athletics and what it can do that this, that this is a muscle that we can work and that we have to keep working on it because it will go soft. Yes. Loved it. Loved yeah. it. So, um, so my second takeaway was um, his reference to the martial arts, the Japanese martial art concept, which is shuhari, which says first one obeys the law, then one breaks the law, and then one makes the law in kind of an advancement of a progression of, of evolving as a human. So I really loved that. And I think, you know, in any thing that we take on in life first we just have to understand the basics of it and kind of get into it and educate ourselves about it so i i love that just you just get in there and you just obey the law and then you maybe go in and you kind of can change things up and and you break the law and then you make the law and i know we have a lot of swimmers listening and and one of the things one of the most famous swimmers and a swimmer that i respect on the level of Lewis Pugh is Michael Phelps. And I think Michael Phelps was a, a classic example of Shuhari where he, you know, he, he went in and he, you know, he started out, just did the regular swimming things. Then he, he, 
he obeyed the law, you know, he got into swimming, started out, then he broke the law, he did, you know, broke all the records, and then he made the law, he changed swimming as a sport, he got the most gold medals ever in an Olympics, and, you know, as an Olympian, he's the greatest Olympian ever, but he changed the sport of swimming, so he made the law, and I, I really think that that's just a great concept for any endeavor that one, uh, any big endeavor that one wants to conquer in life. Oh, yeah. I love that, too. I, I loved he emphasized how long it t- took him to 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 obey or learn the law of swimming and all this, you know, getting the stroke just right. I, I thought that was really good. We, we sometimes want to be great without doing the work. <laughs> and, you know, he's been, yes. he said he'd been swimming for 33 years. And so, and, and so I, I, and I love the concept that, that, because I'm a, ro- a rule follower and I love the idea of, you know, just learning it and doing it like everybody else says, but to really be great, you have to push the boundaries. And he said, you know, he started just going where he, he wasn't supposed to go. And now he is literally creating the law, new law, protecting the oceans around the world. So it's, you know, I, th- I think, he, you know, you're really doing something when you're making the loss. I, I love that story too. And I think about it with my business because I'm, of course, in the bicycle business and we we sell recumbent bikes, which are different. And so I, I didn't know anything about bicycles. So I'm still really in the learning the law and just starting to get into the breaking the law kind of. So I, I, I like that, that it's, we can think of it as a long process. It's a beautiful concept. Yes. Yeah. So, well, another takeaway from this section, which I think will... We can really, we've heard it before, but it, it bears repeating is the importance of your team. And Lewis clearly can't do this by himself. He has amassed an incredible team. And one of the things he talks about, he's doing terribly frightening and dangerous things all the time. Well, not, you know, yes, all the time. And he, he says his team has to be brave. He says courage is contagious, but fear is also contagious. So he wants to surround himself with brave, courageous people. And he's looking, he says, I'm, he likes to push boundaries and he wants, he wants his team to also be willing to push boundaries. He says, I want optimistic realists, not pessimists, not cynics, not dreamers, but people who say, let's do this. Let's roll. People who realize, and this was how he kind of ended it, that time is finite. So there's a sense of urgency. These are optimistic realists who believe that things can be changed and we only have a certain amount of time to change it. And that is why he is successful because he has this, his, this, this inside himself. And he also has surrounded himself with people who, who are, who are brave, who do not show who 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 are who are optimist and realist and I, I think that's why he's been successful. Yes, that that was a very powerful section of his interview. I loved the the whole team concept and you know just just like you said, especially that you know courage is contagious and fear is fear, contagious. So right. who you you know who you surround yourself with is is everything. I mean that's just that's just kind of good in life and and. You know, happiness is contagious and sadness is contagious. I right. mean, emotions are contagious. So I, yeah. I love that. Yeah. And you always talk about rare air. I, I, one of the concepts I've learned from, from you and Mark is, yeah, you're like the people that you surround yourself with. And But this also reminded me that I, as as a person who's part of a team, I have to be brave. I, I, mm-hmm. I have to, I have to, I have to show my team members, I want to surround myself with great people, but I also... I, I have to be brave. I have to be a, a realistic optimist for my team. So it, it, it inspired me personally, and it also inspired me to gather those incredible people around me, as you and I have talked about in, in other ways. But I think it's it's something we seem to talk about in almost every episode. Every champion has a great team, right? Yes, yes, absolutely. Just an, another, another uh, emphasis on that. So we love it. I think it was the, this first half of his interview, there were, there were even more, but we want, you know, we want to crystallize, to, crystallize. Yeah, we want to just crystallize those, those main things. And, and for me, if I had to kind of summarize, 
why he does this, I would say, again, it's that driving purpose that he feels this, you know, urge that we, we do have a short amount of time to, to save the oceans. And, uh, yes. and he's really, he, he said he had a quote in there that was so awesome. Um, he thinks about it, uh, last thing before he goes to bed and the first yes, thing he wakes right. up in the morning. Yeah, that's right. You know, so that's right. Really and the, and the second half, he talks about how you develop that purpose. So we can, I'm looking yes, forward to talking yes. about that. So that's going to wrap part one of this interview with Lewis Pugh. And we hope you'll listen next week for the final half, which is even more inspirational than the first, if you can believe that. See you next week. This week's quote of the week comes to us from Lewis Pugh. Courage is contagious and equally fear is contagious. I try to surround myself with courageous people. We are so grateful that you spent this time with us today, and we hope that you heard something that inspired, motivated, and educated you. Please see below for our copy of the show notes for any links or important information referenced here. Signing off for myself and champion co-host Kelly Palace, we hope you'll join us again soon, and we know you can be a champion. Thank you for listening. You've been listening to the Champions Mojo podcast, designed to make you feel inspired, motivated, and educated. Subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, Spotify, and Google Play. Also, visit championsmojo.com to learn more.